This is the Seller Process Podcast, where we talk about the best systems, processes, and SOPs for your Amazon business so that you can regain control of your time, build up your team, and scale your e-com empire. Welcome, welcome to the Seller Process Podcast. Welcome to all the entrepreneurs, change makers, and business owners. This is Gianmarco. And uh, today's episode is going to be all about conversion rate optimization. And we invited our special guest, Joris Bryan, who is the founder and CEO of Dexter Agency, a remote team of e-commerce conversion optimization and email marketing specialists. The agency serves high revenue e-commerce stores that are ready for continuous growth. With over 1,500 A-B tests under his belt, Joris wrote the book, Kill Your Conversion Killers to help all the online store that he hasn't worked with yet. So welcome to Yoris. Hi, Yoris. How are you doing? Thanks, Gianmarco. Uh, great to be here. I'm, I'm doing fine. Thanks. Great, great. So for all the listeners to, to know, uh, Yoris wrote this book, which is a, it's a great book that I'm, I've already started reading. And uh, uh, you can find that on Amazon selling for, I think, $19. Is that right? That's right. Yeah. Right. So, but then for all the uh, seller process podcast listeners, uh, you guys get this book for free and you will find it uh, in the show notes uh, where, that you can, um, you can find in the, the seller process podcast.com uh, show notes and uh, for this episode. And uh, you will you'll be able to download this book really for free and uh, and start using all the the gems and that that Yoris brought in the book. So uh, Yoris, to start with, so I've read I've read the most important part of your book, and uh, one of the first thing I can see there it's that people are doing something wrong, right? So what is that the common mistake that people do wrong in conversion rate optimization? Yeah, I think that there's a, quite a few things people do wrong when it comes to conversion optimization or conversion rate optimization. Um, and it, those all stem from a lot of misconceptions and misunderstandings around conversion optimization, a lot of myths as well about conversion optimization. And I think it already starts with the term you notice, I'll, I'll say conversion optimization more often than conversion rate optimization. And I think it already starts with the term CRO, conversion rate optimization, because it, it focuses, in my opinion, too heavily on the conversion rate. Whereas if you have an online store, basically your main metric is your revenue. It's not just about the conversion rate. Conversion rate is an interesting KPI to keep track of, but you can increase your conversion rate um, by slashing your prices. Your conversion rate will go up, but your you, your, your profit will go down. Uh, so, it, I mean, it's just, it's very relative, uh, the conversion rate as such. Uh, so you have to look at it um, uh, from a revenue uh, point of uh, view. And well, I mean, that's a whole other discussion, but I, I prefer to call CRO like continuous revenue optimization. It's a little bit closer to what we do uh, than just calling it conversion rate optimization. And I think that's one thing already where, where it starts wrong because a lot of people are over-focused on the conversion rate, uh, but you have to look at it from a revenue and profit uh, point of view. Um, Another misconception I get a lot is that a lot of people think CRO equals A-B testing. And uh, yes, uh, A-B testing is a very important part of uh, CRO or conversion optimization, but it's not the beginning. Uh, it's actually the uh, last step of the process. And a lot of people think like, oh, I want to optimize my site. I'll um, put up a couple of A-B tests and I'm doing CRO. Uh, no, you're not. You're just randomly throwing a spaghetti against the wall and hoping that it sticks. So it's uh, it's it, A-B testing really is the last step of a process and, and not the first step. Um, another thing that I notice a lot when I, I speak to companies is that they think that conversion optimization is, is basically a quick fix. Uh, they say, okay, tell me what I need to change to the site and I'm done. Uh, I've covered that. I can tick it off, off, off my uh, to-do list. I've, I've done zero and I'm done. So it, it requires quite a bit of continuous effort and um, it, it is a longer process where you have to keep uh, doing research and A-B testing. Um, but you, it, it'll be very rewarding, but it's not a quick fix. So that's um, that's that's another mistake I see a lot of people make, thinking like, oh, it's just a, sm a small project and, and uh, I'm done. Um, 
and there's a lot of wrong expectations about zero as well. Um, like people think, oh, every test is going to win because I read case studies uh, out there. And obviously those only mention the winners. They don't mention the losers. And uh, they're like, oh, but all those other people, they get wins. I'll set up an A-B test and every test is going to win. Uh, that's not how it works. <laughs> uh, if, it, if it would work like that, nobody would have to A-B test because you know what's going to win. So why would it test it? So uh, that's another thing. And also... All of those case studies, they promise spectacular results, right? So it's uh, they say like, oh, one uh, small change, and we had a 500% increase in conversions. Usually, that's not going to happen. <laughs> it's, if you if you get a 5% increase, a 10% or a 15%, that's great, and be very happy with it. But uh, if you expect 500%, then uh, you're gonna you're gonna fail miserably because you're gonna be disappointed, uh, and you're gonna give up, uh, and and you're gonna miss out on the the benefits from the continued effort over time. So. Um, I mean, there's there's a lot more things that people do wrong, uh, but a lot of them come from a wrong um, r- wrong idea of what conversion optimization actually is and how you go about it and what you can expect. The expectations is, is very important uh, when, when you start doing conversion optimization. Mm-hmm. I, I really love the concept of uh, continuous revenue optimization. I mean, that's I think that's really one of the key thing because uh, it all starts with with mindset, right? So this is already mm-hmm. like a mindset shift, right? So uh, you're not talking about any more conversion rate optimization. We're talking about you know optimizing what's important, which is in our case revenue, and obviously you know we need to make profit out of a, of that revenue, right? So first. It's it's to to really focus on the optimization of the of the revenue, as you said. So that that's a really important uh, step that people should should uh, uh, start with. And uh, in your in your book, you uh, created this five steps method, which you call the Dexter method. And uh, so this is this is very important for for us because um, you know we're looking in the seller process podcast here to share always some SOPs or, or step-by-step processes, systems. So people will, will find these uh, special uh, like steps, uh, I mean, the, the steps to, to do the co- continuous revenue optimization in your book. And these are outlined in five steps. Uh, Joris, can you please tell us like briefly what are these five steps so we can then go deeper in each of them? Yeah, sure. Um, so the, the- the method is called Dexter method, and Dexter basically stands for data, execute, test, evaluate, and repeat. So if you put those first letters together, you got Dexter. Um, but so the, basically, the data step is really trying to understand where uh, people are dropping off on your site, how much money you're losing because people are dropping off on those uh, particular steps on your site, um, and and that's a lot of Google Analytics uh, research. Uh, but in the data step, you also want to try to answer the why question. Why are people actually dropping off? And that's um, a lot of people make a mistake of looking at Google Analytics and, and thinking Google Analytics is going to tell you why. And obviously, it, on a quantitative basis, it can give you a hint. But if you see there's a huge drop off on product pages, for instance, why are people not adding to the cart? Or, uh, yeah, then there's a, a bunch of potential explanations that you will probably not find in, in analytics and unless you see that it's a very slow page. For instance, that could be a potential um, explanation. But usually you'll need other research methods to try and figure out why people are dropping off. And, and those use, uh, research methods could be expert review, uh, user testing, form analysis, click maps, crawlers. There's a whole bunch of research methods that you can use um, to understand why uh, people are dropping off. And once you've done that data step, so and, and you know where people are dropping off, how much that represents, why they're dropping off, um, and, and then it's time to execute. And execute basically is just implement stuff because not everything needs to be A-B tested. A-B tested. If you find a bug, for instance, obviously you don't need to A-B test that, just solve the bug. Um, so that's uh, that, that's the execute step. And then there's a whole bunch of things that will uh, come from the research that you think like, okay, this might be a problem, but I'm not 100% sure. Um, the, the, or there might be an opportunity here to increase uh, the conversion rate or the revenue. And um, I'm not 100% sure if it is going to work out or not. And that's when you start testing. So you test different solutions. You put set up an AP test. You drive 50% of traffic to one, uh, to the original version of 50% of the traffic to um, the, the, the variation that you just created. And you look at the numbers and see what uh, works best. Um, every test obviously needs to be evaluated. And in the evaluation phase, so the fourth phase, you will get a lot of... Um, uh, extra insights, you'll uh, uh, discover new data, new data that will lead to maybe new A-B testing ideas or, or new insights into your customer behavior. You, you'll know, oh, apparently this is an important 
um, USB for our customers because we tested making it more prominent and, and it increased our uh, conversion rate. So they respond positively to, uh, to, to that USB. Maybe we should use it in, more in our com campaigns or put it more prominently on another site. So you learn something from um, evaluating every test. And it's time to repeat because you uh, have to, well, it never stops with one test. Usually when we do research, we we easily have like 100 uh, A-B test IDs that come from uh, from a research. And um, and every new test, every test that you've done and evaluated might trigger new IDs. So it, you repeat that entire cycle. So you, you got to look at it as a cyclical process instead of a, a linear process. That's in a nutshell uh, what the Dexter method is. Right, right. That's interesting. So it's a, it's a cyclical process, not a linear process. So that's really important to keep in mind. And everything starts with data. Everything starts with understanding what's what's the problem basically right and then yep. go there and see and try to optimize what we can and but one thing that you say it's very important crucial in the research phase is the so-called expert review what is that mm -hmm. it's, not, it's not really common people are not really talking about that so i think it's a very interesting concept right no it's a, an excellent question and and we call it an expert review some other People call it an expert review as well. You'll see the term heuristic analysis out there as well. It's the same thing, basically. But a heuristic analysis, I think that sounds too academic. <laughs> um, and so basically, we call it an expert review because it's still maybe not clear to everyone what it is, but explains it a little bit better. It's um, What it comes down to is, is uh, an expert who goes over your site and points out potential issues. And I think it's important to, um, to stress that it's potential issues um, because it's just one person go, going over the site, but obviously you can, you can find issues that, like that. But what you try to do is find those potential issues and then look at other data points to see whether it is actually an issue or not. But it's, it's just a, a starting point to, to uncover potential um, uh, issues. And the way you can do that, um, I mean, in, in my in my book, I give a lot of pointers on doing that yourself, so that you can basically become the, the expert and you don't need to hire uh, anyone. But you can um, you can do it by using a, a, a few frameworks that are out there. There's, for instance, the Lift model. If you Google the Lift model, um, that's that's one of those frameworks. There's a few others uh, out there as well. But basically, what it all comes down to is looking at your page and thinking of a couple of um, uh, criteria and so one of those criteria is clarity so is everything very clear on this page is there any ambiguous language in any questions that i have that are not answered on this page um, and clarity is very and it's, it's underestimated as a uh, as a, an important factor uh, for conversion so if people don't understand what you do they will never buy from you and um, i see uh, a lot of people or companies that try to be clever or funny or uh, use psychological principles, but people don't even understand what you do or what you sell. And uh, obviously that's a big problem. So clarity is, it, it's the most important factor. So you, you look at your side and think, is everything clear? And there's a, a principle like friction. Friction is anything that creates frustration or uh, pisses people off or uh, just uh, slows them down in the process. So if you go to the side page by page, you just Look at, is there anything creating friction here? Um, another uh, criteria is, is distraction. Is there anything that distracts people from um, from doing what they need to do on this particular page? If that's the case, you could probably remove it or test removing it. Um, but also motivation and incentives. Is my copy motivating enough for people? Are there any incentives for them to take action? Um, another principle is trust, for instance. Do, do people actually trust it? Does it look trustworthy? Uh, can we do? Uh, can we add something to make it look more trustworthy? So there's a few of those criteria that you can use to go over any uh, page, basically. And you just take criteria by criteria and you go over the page and, and, and try to find potential issues. Again, that's the, the starting point. And then you'll look into other research methods to see if you can confirm or deny whether it's actually an, an, an issue. Mm -hmm. Okay, got it. So basically, it's like about being uh, an expert, putting the hat of the expert and start going one by one each area of your website and see whether you're doing like the, the best practices or, or there is something off. Is that, is that how it should be? It's it's more yeah well that's that's where you start. I'm not a big fan of best, the word best practice because a lot of people think it's it's the only practice in, and we've seen uh, it in many cases. It's, I, I have a problem with the word best because uh, we've tested in many cases uh, like a best practice on uh, certain e-commerce sites, and then on some it wins, on actually on others uh, it actually loses. So. Um, if you only follow best practices, uh, it's not always going to work for you because every site is different, has a different target audience, and and it's it, best practice doesn't work for all the sites. That's just 
the reality. But yes, it is some kind of yeah tangible criteria to evaluate your site, but don't take it as the end point, but as a starting point. So you have to be very critical and, and, and think of like, okay, is this really the case? Can I see evidence for that in the rest of the data? Um, and, and don't just stop at, oh, it's a best practice, so I'm done. Uh, because we've, we've seen a lot of best practices actually uh, costing revenue to our clients instead of adding revenue. So that's uh, it's important to keep in mind. Right, absolutely, yeah, makes sense. And uh, I will put in the show notes, actually, the framework that you just mentioned. And also, guys, remember that there is a lot in the, a lot in the book uh, that you can learn about all. Uh, yours right now is just uh, uh, touching the, the surface of every steps. But if you read the book, you will you will understand much much better and, and more in depth uh, what we are talking about. And just to you know touch each point of the of this cycle of these five steps one thing that got me um, interested into um, is that uh, you, know, you know here uh, most people have an amazon uh, storefront you know they they have an amazon account um, uh, for mo they mostly uh, have the the majority of their revenue through through amazon and have a, a shopify store that is uh, something that uh, is more for for branding they many people also have um, good sales for, through that but uh, I would say most might might not so one thing that got me interested is that uh, when we are we need to set a b tests what would be the, the minimum amount of traffic that we need to to uh, to run those tests because I would guess uh, most people have that problem of low traffic so would it be relevant to set a b tests in that case with low traffic yeah so just for yourself to know what the threshold is for a b testing um so if you run an a b test you should aim for about at least 250 to 350 um, conversions per variation so in in uh, reality that means that if you don't have around a thousand conversions it could be 900 but around 900 to a thousand conversions per month uh you shouldn't be focusing on on a b testing however that doesn't mean that you cannot do anything about conversion optimization um you can do the data step and try to understand uh, what you can fix and maybe well usually you will find things that can be optimized you will get a good insight into your users as well and um, you'll make a few changes that if you would have enough traffic normally you would test it but if your data is pretty conclusive and you're pretty sure you can implement uh, quite a few things uh, so it doesn't mean that you, you cannot do anything um, to, to improve your conversions um, it's it's just a matter of doing really good research and anything that you're pretty sure of go ahead and implement it it's better than doing nothing so um, even though you cannot a b test at least you're taking some action there Right, right, makes sense. And uh, obviously, you know, people, I, I, I would say people should go first for the, the big wins, you know, the things that they can fix as, as soon as possible, you know, with the least effort. Uh, those yeah. typically are, you know, don't need too much, you know, data to understand that something is wrong in those specific areas, right? They, they can uh, easily understand that and fix it. But in, yeah. in the case, we have several things that, so uh, our, our research gave us uh, lots of points of improvement, right? So in that mm -hmm. case, how can we prioritize what to test, what to test first and, and then execute? I, I, I saw in your, in your book, there are a few frameworks that you're talking about in the so-called yeah. Dexter score. So can you tell me more about that? So if, when it comes to deciding what you should be testing and uh, what you can just go ahead and implement, so execute, it's it's a, it's not easy. A lot of people struggle with that in the beginning. So I've included basically two step, well, two two models that you can uh, use um, to understand what you should be doing when. And one is so there's something called the hierarchy of conversions, and uh, what it comes down to is um, uh, there's functional and accessibility issues, there's usability issues on top, then there's intuitiveness issues, and on top there's psychology stuff. Um, now the psychology stuff you should always A/B test that because it could backfire. Uh, so if if it's a, a something a psychological principle, for instance, you should test that. If it's more function about functionality and accessibility, you don't need to test that. You can just execute that. And then there's in between there's a layer of usability, intuitive, intu intuitiveness. Um, in that case, there's a lot of confusion usually when it's those issues. Uh, well, we use a T-Rex matrix. Um, well, we, we've invented that term because uh, it's about test or execute T-Rex. Um, and uh, what you look at is basically two dimensions. You look at, is it possibly an issue? You're not 100% sure. Or is it definitely an issue? 
And then solutions. Is there only one solution or are there multiple solutions? Now, it's only so if you if you have those in four quadrants, basically what it comes down to, if it's a, a definite issue, so you're 100% sure it's an issue and there's only one solution to that issue, just execute. If there are several solutions to that issue, you test which solution works best. Um, and if it's not 100% sure an issue, even if, if there's just one solution or multiple solutions, doesn't matter, you test it. So that's basically a two-step process. First, you look at where in the hierarchy of conversions are you? Is it more towards the bottom functional accessibility than you just execute? Is it towards the top psychological stuff than you test? Anything in between, you uh, apply the T-Rex matrix. And I know it's very hard to, if you don't see it before you, it's it's hard to follow probably what I'm saying, uh, but it's, I, I assure you in, in, in the book, it's it's explained pretty uh, pretty easily. And once you see the visuals, you're going to be like, ah, uh -huh, okay, that's actually uh, an, an easy way to understand what I should be testing or, uh, or executing. Right, right, exactly. So guys, go to the to the show notes and download the, the book and you everything will be more clear. These, there are really, really tons of metrics and frameworks and uh, uh, processes that you can you can um, you can benefit from in the in the book so because uh, yours really has a, a mindset of uh, like what we, we what we like in the seller process podcast so uh, everything it's about systems and systematizing your business so so he does that in every single step of the conversion optimization process so but when people start to A-B tests, what, what do you think are the, the most common mistakes that we can avoid uh, doing these tests? Yeah, there's a, a, quite a few, and I'll try to be brief because uh, there's uh, quite a few mistakes that you can make. But the most common, uh, I think the mistake number one is stopping a test too early. So you think like, oh, it's, it's, it's winning, but you only have 50 conversions per variation and you stop it. Well, in reality, if you would have, um, if you would have let it run uh, the time it needed, it it might have flipped. We see that all the time. So in the beginning, one variation seems to be winning. But if you keep it running, uh, all of a sudden, at one point, it, 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 the other one takes over, and the other one is actually a winner. So um, it, that's the, the biggest mistake you can make, because you might be implementing losers to your side, because you think like, oh, I've tested it. Uh, no, I have 50 conversions. I'm more than enough. Uh, I'll pull the plug, and I'll just implement uh, the winning variation. So um, another one that I see is uh, not running a test in, in full cycles of, of, of a week. So when you look at your conversion rate, for instance, on a Thursday night or Sunday morning, it's usually going to be different because people are in a different mindset. So if you test something, people might direct, uh, react differently to uh, a variation on a Thursday night and on a Sunday morning, for instance. So uh, you want to make sure you cover an entire week. So when you test, always test in cycles of seven days. If you don't have enough conversions after one full week, you add immediately another week, um, a full week. So you don't stop a uh, bit way after 10 days. No, you need to let it run two weeks. Another a very big mistake I see a lot of people make is not doing a good uh, quality uh, assurance test before you put the test live. So you create a variation, you push it live, and actually, for instance, it doesn't work on, uh, let's say, Firefox on Android. Um, and because you haven't checked it, and it, it, it doesn't work there. Uh, now, if you're not aware of that, and I've seen numbers about that, and it's pretty high. I believe it's about 60% of all tests that are created and pushed live are actually broken on certain device, browser device combination, for instance. And um, that's, a, that's a pretty high number. What happens then is you think like, oh, B didn't win, but actually B didn't work on one of your browser device combinations. And um, uh, so you cannot trust the data, but you were not aware of it. So you may have missed out on a, on a big winner, uh, but you think it lost and, and it actually was not working. So um, whenever we set up a test, we spend a lot of time doing a QA to make sure that it, it works uh, perfectly fine. Uh, the test variation works perfectly fine on all browsers and devices, and it's super important, uh, that one. And related to that is that a lot of A-B test tools have like a WYSIWYG editor, um, where you see what you get, and then so you can move things around. Not a good idea. You need you need a developer, because if you use that WYSIWYG editor, apart from maybe changing headlines or something like that, it's very likely that you'll break stuff, uh, that you'll break a test. And uh, so that's uh, that's not a good idea. You need a, a front-end developer to set up um, your, your A-B test. I think those are a few of the most common uh, mistakes, but there's a lot more, and, and I explain a lot more <laughs> about this in, in, in my book as well. But I think those are the most common uh, mistakes I see. Exactly. Cool, cool. Sounds very interesting. Guys, you can find many more examples in the in the book. 
And uh, remember that all of these the conversion uh, mistakes, uh, sorry, test uh, mistakes, uh, can be applicable also for the the, the new experiments, so called in in Amazon, uh, where the, only only for brand owners you can access to to A B tests, and that's available right now only for titles or images and A plus content. But most of the of the common mistakes that yours just uh, just said also are applicable for that. So just keep Keep in mind those, and um, you know. Then, in the last step, we should evaluate uh, our results. So, how yeah. should we go about that? It's also a matter of mindset, I, I think. And uh, uh, how should we interpret the the results that we get? Yeah, um, the, it's it's not easy to give a quick answer to that. But I'll, I'll try to uh, be brief as well and and just give the most important things. I, I think one is if you use it and. Um, an A-B testing tool, don't analyze your data in your A-B testing tool. Make sure it's it's linked to your Google Analytics and analyze it there because you can dig a lot deeper. Um, and uh, one of the uh, things that you need to look at are segments. We've had it many times where you set up a test and it's cross device, and then you look at it overall, A and B, there's no significant difference. And then you apply a segment and you look at, let's say, mobile. And on mobile, it's a huge winner. Uh, but it goes unnoticed because on uh, desktop, it's a big loser. So they even each other out. Uh, whereas if you know it's a big winner on mobile, you can just implement that change on mobile and keep the other version on, on desktop. That's perfectly doable. So you, you just need to apply those segments and, and, and dig a little bit deeper than what you see at surface level. I think that's a, a very important one. Um, and another thing is, and, and I'm definitely not going to go in detail there because that's a very boring matter, but it's it's uh, which... Uh, statistics do you use. So there's Bayesian and frequency statistics and um, everyone, well, not everyone, but most people are using Bayesian nowadays. Um, and basically just to explain at a very high level what the difference is, but Bayesian statistics help you understand whether it's a good business decision or not. Um, and that's all what it, what it's about. I mean, it's not, an A-B test is not a, a life or death threatening situation and we need to be 100% uh, sure no, it's like, is this a good decision to make this change or not? And so Bayesian is a lot more suited to help you answer that question. So either if you see stuff out there about 95% significance and that kind of stuff, always ask yourself like, oh, or try to find out if it's Bayesian or frequentist and it changes quite a bit uh, in terms of interpretation and Bayesian is a lot more pragmatic. So um, we always use uh, Bayesian statistics. Okay, guys, as you can see, Yoris knows what he's talking about. So you can learn more from from him in from his book. And uh, you can always obviously reach him out if you if you want to get help uh, with uh, your, your website conversion optimization. So last question, Yoris, before we, we say goodbye, what would be the best recommendation that you you could give to Amazon sellers that use Shopify as their second channel, not, not their first? So it's like a supportive channel. What, yeah. What's your best advice for, for them? Yeah, I think what I typically see, we, we work with a lot of Amazon sellers who at one point they switched to Shopify and when they, they reach a certain size on Shopify, uh, we start working with them. And um, what, what we see is that, or what I would see is say is at some point you have to prioritize Shopify a bit more. Uh, first of all, a lot of Amazon sellers, they, they, they want to sell their business at some point. Um, your valuation is going to be a lot higher if you have a Shopify uh, set up as well. Invest quite a bit in email marketing, I would say. Uh, that's going to be very important for your valuation as well. If you have a good uh, list that is very engaged and, and stuff, so that's that's important as well. But I, I would say like make it a priority in time, well in the ahead of time. Uh, if you're thinking of selling, then selling the company, that's it's. I, I'd say it's too late to start uh, prioritizing Shopify. You should uh, do that uh, well ahead of time. And the, the good thing about Shopify versus Amazon is that you'll, you'll get a much better understanding of your customer. So that would be my main focus is really trying to get more understanding of your customer, you build that relationship. Um, and, and with email marketing, you can do a lot more. Uh, so there's, uh, if you have Klaviyo set up, for instance, you can do a lot more. And, and it'll help you fine tune and understand who your person is, basically your target audience is. And I, I think once you know who your person is, everything else is going to be so much more, so much easier. And uh, because, you know, maybe it's mainly mountain bikers who buy your products. You're like, oh, okay, I can target my marketing uh, to mountain bikers. And it's not just uh, ads, but all my languaging uh, is geared toward towards mountain bikers, for instance. So this, it, it makes everything a lot easier because you get a better understanding of who your uh, person is. And I would take it even one step further. And it is 
what I see that most Amazon sellers is, and most e-commerce in general, they're, um, if, if it's on Amazon, if they have their own or they have their own store, usually they're um, in love with their product. I'd say fall in love with your person, not your product. Because if you put your person, your target person, front and center of your business, everything else is going to be so much easier. So that would be my main uh, reason to, to make Shopify more of a, of a, of a priority. Absolutely. Yeah, totally, totally agree with you. Uh, the, the best takeaway from it, guys, if you have to take one thing out of this, only one thing out of this podcast, I would say, don't fall in love with your product, fall in love with your customer, basically. So that's really, really important. Uh, I would say it's, it's, it's uh, the most important thing, especially for, for private label sellers on Amazon that uh, of, too often, you know, they just focus on Amazon and they, they just um, you know, throw product in the marketplace without a really clear understanding of their customer, of who their customer is. And after you really do the, the work that yours just said, you set up your Shopify store and then you, you create your email list, you will, you will start building a relationship with your customer and you will understand them better. And that way you will, you will have more information to build products that suits them. And most of the time, actually by emails or Facebook groups, you can really communicate with them and actually um, ask them what products would they would, would like would they like to buy. So that that's really really an important step for everyone um, that it's it's taking e-commerce business seriously. Well, so uh, Yoris, that's that was a uh, what's a lot of information. I I hope you know people will digest all of this information that they they just listen and and they will uh, you know guys you can find everything uh, about what what Yoris just said in the in the show notes uh, through through the through the link in the show notes you will be able to download the, his book, which right now it's selling for nineteen dollars in Amazon but he gave us for free guys so we really thank you Yoris and how how people can connect with you so maybe if some of if some of them are interested in your services they would like to they would like help from you to increase their conversion and revenue uh, how they can how can they find you. Yeah, so um, feel free to email me at yours at dexter.agency uh, or what you can do as well is connect with me on LinkedIn. I'm pretty active on LinkedIn, uh, so feel free to connect uh, there as well. Um, I, I think those are the, the main two channels um, and, and, and obviously you can check us out on our website, dexter.agency as well. Great, great, great. Thank you very much, Yoris, again for your time and for sharing with us your knowledge. And uh, I hope to see you again in another future episode. Hey, entrepreneurs, I hope you enjoyed the show and learned something from the interview. Subscribe to this channel so you won't miss the next episodes. And remember to go grab the free downloads of this episode at thesellerprocess.com. And don't forget to sign up to our free email list to get the latest systems and SOPs shared exclusively with our subscribers. Thanks for watching and see you soon.